Hello, thanks for tuning into this virtual talk. I'll be talking about some research sponsored by the Department of Energy uh, for an Energy Frontier Research Center called Breakthrough Electrolytes for Energy Storage, also known as BEES. And this research is being done by multiple universities and organizations you can see down here. I personally am from the University of Notre Dame and we focus on computational simulations for deep eutectic solvents. And so today I'll be presenting some research that's been done for liquid structure and transport properties for ethylene. So first off, uh, why are we doing this research? Uh, what exactly is the energy storage that we're focusing on? And that would be a flow battery. So flow battery is different than your typical uh, standard, um, for example, lithium ion battery, a solid state battery or something like that, uh, where uh, instead of an anode and a cathode in one nice neat little package, you have two big tanks of electrolytes. So you would have an analyte and a catholyte. And rather than having, having them flow across the membrane, um, you would have them react here just in a little cell. And so what this, hap what this allows for are, first of all, you have dimension of stable electrodes. These aren't going to change in size or composition. Uh, also, because it's a flowing electrolyte, as soon as you stop the flow, there's no more power delivery. So if there's a runaway reaction, you can cut it off right there. Uh, you also, and this is the, a big one, you decouple power and energy storage. So if you need um, more energy, you can easily scale this up by having bigger tanks or more tanks. And if you need more power delivery, you can just scale up the number of power delivery cells. And these can be done independently, whereas in a typical battery, you have to design that battery specifically for a set energy and power delivery um, constraints. And this allows for them to be, flow batteries to be very scalable to large systems. So it's perfect. And what we're focusing on are, so, are these three critical areas here. So we can focus on reactant solubility, mass and ion transport, and interfacial electron transfer and mechanisms. And sort of tuning these to be preferential for flow batteries uh, is what we're looking at. One particular way that, uh, particular, particular electrolyte that we're looking at are deep eutectic solvents. Um, these are typically composed of a hydrogen bond donor and a hydrogen bond acceptor. And what we can do is we can look at the solvents um, to dissolve high concentrations of redox species dissolved in them, or we can simply make, or not simply, it's a little more complicated, but we can make the hydrogen bond donor or the hydrogen bond acceptor redox functionalized or redox active. And this just increases the concentration of redox species in the solvent um, by multiple uh, orders of magnitude. Now, What's challenging about this is there is a fundamental lack of understanding about deep eutectic solvents currently. Um, we need to have a better understanding of the physical and molecular properties such as density, volatility, and solvation. Um, critically, we need to know about their transport and rheology properties. You can imagine that viscosity is going to be really important in a flow battery. And similarly, at that power delivery cell, we need to make sure we fully understand their dynamics to uh, get the best power delivery rate. And a lot of this is related to the structure and the hydrogen bonding network of a deep eutectic solvent. You can imagine hydrogen bond acceptors and donors, hydrogen bonding is gonna be critical in such a solvent. Uh, just first off, um, a little bit of explaining how these deep eutectic solvents work in flow batteries. Uh, we can see up here their energy density is quite, um, quite great compared to conventional aqueous batteries. Uh, you can see here in the dark blue is a, um, a, an aqueous vanadium battery. Meanwhile, in these different shaded areas are different metals in um, reline or ethylene flow batteries. And so you can get quite a high concentration of redox species and quite a wide a voltage window. So you can see the voltage window down here as compared to water. And at the top right, we can show that this is like a proof of concept. This definitely works. Um, a prototype flow battery demo with iron as your redox species is cyclable in an ethylene flow battery. So this works. Now we can just focus on uh, power density targets. So different transport properties like diffusion, conduction, re rheology, and also the interfacial kinetics that I mentioned before. This talk will be more focused on understanding their transport properties and structure uh, rather than the interfacial kinetics that sort of comes later after we have a good understanding of bulk properties. So the research that I'm presenting today is all uh, has been published in this paper here, Liquid Structure and Transfer Properties of the Deep Eutectic Solvent Ethylene. Um, so if you would like to read more in detail, please feel free to go find this journal article. 
So first we're looking at a model system of ethylene. Uh, ethylene is a great starting point. Uh, it's composed of the choline, chlo choline chloride as your hydrogen bond acceptor and ethylene glycol as your hydrogen bond donor. Uh, and this is combined in a one to two ratio of acceptor to donor. And you can see their structure up here. Now, the properties of ethylene are very well established in literature. There's a decent amount of experimental data. Uh, a lot of the publications to date are more focused on practical applications of this DP technic solvent, less so fundamental understanding. And that's where we see sort of a lack of comprehensive studies. And there's a decent amount of disagreement in literature on um, the physical properties themselves and how they arise. And furthermore, we want to validate our methods against this sort of, for lack of like a better or basic um, DP technic solvent. And once we validate it against ethylene, we can move on to other or more complex DESs. We can start adding in charge carriers or redox active species. And then there's also the option of adding in uh, additives to improve certain structural and dynamic properties that we would um, like. First, we want to validate our liquid density. Uh, for those of you who know computational research, uh, if we can't get liquid density right, uh, we're probably not going to get much else right afterwards. Uh, on the left here at the top is ethylene glycol, and at the right is ethylene. For both of these, in black is previous literature published results, in blue is experimental work done by our collaborators that are part of this paper, and red is the simulated results um, that we performed at Notre Dame. And you can see that while we overestimate density for ethylene glycol slightly, uh, given the scale, we're well within normal expectations for reproduction for simulations. Uh, similarly for ethylene, we're actually even better. We're right on the money. Uh, there's not too much deviation in literature data for density. And similarly, uh, the simulated data, the experimental data from this work, and all literature data agree fairly well. Our experimental collaborators for the data in blue developed very stringent uh, synthesis and characterization methods to minimize contamination, namely water. And uh, that'll pop up later as to why it's important. It's, it doesn't appear to have much of an effect here. Next, another way we can look at structure is liquid um, uh, neutron scattering, sorry. And we can do this experimentally through the NOMAD system at ORNL. And we can also do this through molecular dynamics and ab initio molecular dynamics simulations. Comparing our results uh, for the classical molecular dynamics to AIMD results being done at NYU, uh, we see that for a um, RDF for a G of R, you can see that we capture a lot of these structural features, the overall shape very well, even though there's a little bit difference in peak height, getting this shape right is, uh, like, is a very good sign that we're capturing the same uh, structural behaviors and structural, um, I guess, uh, qualities. On the right is also a simulated uh, neutron scattering factor in SFQ, and you can see that uh, CMD at 400 Kelvin matches AIMD very well, and that there is the, the uh, 298 Kelvin CMD is identical to the 400 Kelvin CMD. So we take this to mean that we can go ahead and use our CMD model to do larger system A systems. AIMD is typically constrained to shorter time scales and smaller system sizes. So now that we've validated the CMD model, we can move on to um, make bigger systems capture uh, dynamics as well, which AIMD typically struggles with due to the shorter time scales. Comparing our CMD scattering results to actual um, experimental results that I mentioned done over at ORNL, you can see that our simulated results are in red and experimental results are in black. And these are done for different deuteration states. So you can have deuterated ethylene glycol and deuterated choline chloride or various um, mixtures for non-deuterated of those compounds. And we see that the MD simulations uh, generally show very good agreement with experiments. Um, so there are some slight differences in peak uh, height, but for the most part, this is excellent agreement for simulations and um, experimental neutron scattering. So again, we can use this as validation to move on and probe detailed structure with our simulations. 
one area that is of particular um, concern or that requires great focus is the chloride anion. This is the uh, strong hydrogen bond acceptor in this particular deep detected solvent. And we see up here at the top left that there's a very strong association between the chloride and the hydroxyl groups for both choline chlor for both the choline and the ethylene glycol, which is good. That's uh, to be expected for hydrogen bond um, interactions. Uh, what we see down here is a probability distribution of the different hydroxyls in group type groups interacting with that chloride. And we see that um, there's anywhere from one zero to two uh, choline hydroxyls interacting with it in, um, a given chloride anion. Um, but there's this very wide distribution of the number of uh, ethylene glycol hydroxyls interacting with that chloride anion. And so we take this to mean that there's a very dynamic solvation environment. It's very complex. Uh, previous literature believed that ethylene glycols sort of coordinated the chloride almost um, like it was chelating it in a certain fashion and this moves around in like a packet. And we see that this isn't the case. We see it's a very uh, dynamic, very uh, complex solvation environment. Another thing of particular concern is knowing what changes when you go from a pure solvent to the deep eutectic solvent. And there is a noticeable change in um, dynamics. The, when you add in choline chloride, it sort of, it, the uh, overall solvent gets uh, less uh, dynamic, much more viscous, and we want to know why is that happening. And so this is the same, uh, similar type of probability distribution for coordination numbers. In the solid line is ethylene, so that's the pure, um, or that's the deep eutectic solvent. And in the uh, dashed line is the pure solvent ethylene glycol. And what we see for ethylene glycol, where you used to have um, only 20% of non-self bonding. So this, these coordination numbers are for self-hydroxyl interactions for the ethylene glycol. Uh, only 20% was not self-interacting, self-hydrogen bonding. And the majority was at least had one, two, and then tailing off to three. Now, if you look at the deep eutectic solvents, upwards of 70% of your ethylene glycol is no longer in self-hydrogen bonding with itself. And so introducing choline chloride significantly disrupts this EG self-association. You go from 80% self-bonded to 72% unbonded. And this is a very drastic swing. So moving on to the dynamics that I was just mentioning, um, we can uh, first check viscosity. So on the left, again, is pure ethylene glycol. And on the right is the deep eutectic solvent ethylene. And you can see that previous literature results in black compared to this ex this. Um, experiments results. Uh, the experimental results in blue match up very well and our simulated results while we do uh, underestimate the dynamics a little bit uh, or overestimate the dynamics a little bit, underestimate the viscosity, um, the trends is matched fairly well. And you can see on the right that we do tend to have a little bit slower dynamics for the deep eutectic solvent but again we match the dynamic trends very well. Now this is the interesting part here, is that our collaborators' results actually were a little higher than previous literature reported results. And this is uh, what we believe, uh, this comes from that rigorous control of your contaminant, making sure that your deep eutectic solvent is very much dry, has very little to no water in it. And it shows the importance of that contaminant control that we don't really see mentioned as much in literature at the moment. We can also take a look at hydrogen bond dynamics. As I mentioned, these are very, um, uh, these are full of hydrogen bond acceptors and donors, and we want to know what the dynamics are like um, in both of these systems, both the pure and the deep eutectic solvent. So down here at the bottom, uh, we can see that I've highlighted the uh, self hydrogen bonding interaction, and you can see that there's a coordination number of about 0.93 on average. And on average, these hydrogen bond um, self-bonding interactions last for about uh, 32 picoseconds. Now, if you look up here at, for ethylene, uh, this same self-hydrogen bond network has gone down to 0.3 from 0.9, and the time constant has gone up to 80 picoseconds. So this is significantly increased in time length. 
the main contributor to these slow dynamics though we believe is this introduction of the chloride hydrogen bonding interactions. So you see that there's a very high count of these 2.52, so a very large coordination number. And the actual time constant for the duration of this is very, very long. It's an order of magnitude higher than the self-hydrogen bonding interaction for ethylene glycol at 972 picoseconds. So we see that EG self interactions um, become longer with the introduction of choline chloride, but the main culprit is that EG exchanges these self interactions for very long lasting uh, chloride interactions. So just to sum everything up, um, for ethylene glycol versus ethylene, uh, experimental collaborators, our, our experimental collaborators at Case Western demonstrated the importance of thorough water removal. It doesn't seem to have much of an effect on just density, but it's going to have a very noticeable effect on your dynamics. Um, we also see excellent structure factor agreement with experimental neutron scattering as well as ab initio molecular dynamics. So that shows that our CMD simulation is uh, working quite well. Uh, the results show that coordination environment of the chloride anion hydrogen bond acceptor is very diverse. And you do have a range of cholines and a broad spread of ethylene glycol coordination numbers. Uh, it's not like a neat little packet that um, some literature sources have, have mentioned. And finally, we see that ethylene glycol self interactions are really disrupted in favor of very long lasting interactions with chloride. And so we believe this is the main, um, main cause for your slow dynamics in ethylene as compared to ethylene glycol. So wrapping everything, or just some acknowledgements, um, I want to thank my advisor, Dr. Ed McGinn, um, our senior scientist, Dr. Yang Zheng, and the rest of the McGinn group for all their help with this research. Uh, I'd also like to thank our collaborators that contributed to this um, presentation, Dr. Birchie Gherkin at Case Western, Dr. Mark Dadman over at uh, University of Tennessee and also at ORNL, and Dr. Mark Tuckerman at NYU. And of course, I would like to thank our sponsor again, the U.S. Department of Energy. Uh, without them, this research wouldn't have been possible. And thank you for your time. Um, I'll take any questions through the chat or the live session or feel free to email me. Thank you.